I think I was always drawn to um, being an extrovert. I've always been outgoing. Um, but I think the first formal public speaking activity that I was ever really engaged in was in eighth grade. I was in 4-H mm -hmm. and uh, we lived in California. We had moved from Ohio and we had a half an acre and the folks next door to us had a, a pregnant sow and which I thought was very strange on a half an acre having come from farmland mm -hmm. and they when they're um, sow farrowed they gave me one of the pigs to raise um, for 4-H mm -hmm. and so we lived next door to them and they had their pigs and I had my pigs and their sons were in 4-H and so I joined the local 4-H club and about that time the count the city zoning was going to change the zoning laws and so all these kids that were around us that were in 4-H a lot of them would have had their 4-H ability taken away from them because they wouldn't have been able to have animals myself included so we they dressed us up in our little 4-H whites and our little green scarves and our green hats and off we went to the city planning commission meeting and when we got there um, I'm a very passionate person and so they were talking about why it wasn't healthy and good to have these animals and so I got up and and asked us you know they asked if there's anybody from the audience that wanted to speak so I got up and said you know yes and they said, you know, state your name for the record. So I said, my name is Denise Krause, and I'm a 4-H student, and I don't care what you do with this because I'm going to raise my pig and take it to Hemet, which was the local county fair. And so the next morning, I got up, and I was front page in the local newspaper, and uh, it said, Denise Cross, a local 4-H girl says she doesn't care what they say because she's going to raise her pig and take it to heaven. <laughs> and so, of course, I was unmercifully teased for a long time about taking my pig to he heaven with me. And that was kind of the, my first foray into public speaking and where I learned a lot about the press and enunciation and articulation and to make sure that you speak slowly enough and clearly enough that people can understand your message yeah. rather than creating messages for you. Mm -hmm. So then I went to high school and I was very involved in Future Farmers of America and they had a creed contest my freshman year so you had to recite the creed so I did that and I was a I went to the regionals. The creed, how long is the creed? Creeds, um, it's probably like six stanzas. Oh. It's not really lengthy. Um, but I had to be memorized. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of my freshman year, I moved to another school. And that was a little bit traumatic for me. And I started FFA again. Mm -hmm. And that school also happened to have a speech team. And my English teacher invited me to the speech banquet. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the speech banquet and these students performed oral interpretation. They were doing dramatic interp and comedic interp. And, um, impromptu speeches and persuasion and informative speeches and I was just fascinated by this competition and the event so I decided that I wanted to join the speech team. Well lo and behold we moved again that summer and I ended up in a new high school um, that didn't have a speech team, um, did have FFA and so I did FFA and in my freshman year all through FFA I did parliamentary procedure. Mm. Um, and I also did um, later on public speaking. But so my s sophomore year, I did the public the parliamentary procedure because that was the only event available to me. And then my parents were going to move again. And we moved back to the district where I had very first started. Mm -hmm. So I rejoined FFA and we didn't have a speech team. And so I got a hold of my English teacher and I found out that she had done forensics in college. And so I begged her and begged her and begged her to start a speech team. And so she said, okay, if you help me recruit, I will. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, um, my parents left and I stayed um, and moved on my own my junior year. But I ended up doing public speaking in both FFA and then um, starting a speech team. So I was captain of the speech team my junior and senior year of mm -hmm. high school. And I did mostly dramatic and trip events. Um, and partly because I just didn't think I was quick enough or smart enough to do impromptu or debate or anything like that. Uh, so I, that was what I did. And I did fairly well because uh, I was always the most prepared student. 
And so as I, I would start really well, and then people would catch me um, because it wasn't as natural to me. So I had to work really hard. And so I was always really good at the beginning, and then people would catch up to me. My senior year, my coach talked me into doing Model United Nations. And I had a blast. And so I went to Model United Nations, and I was probably the only person in the history of the league that was um, both the novice um, sp speaker of the house and also the novice um, speaker. I mean, I won everything. And it was just really fun because you really had to prepare. In order to be good at it, you had to have some knowledge about the country you were representing, and then you sort of got to role play how that country would react in different situations. What country did you have? Venezuela. So we had oil, <laughs> even then. <laughs> so, you know, it was just an interesting um, dynamic for me. And I really, really liked that. So I went on to, to college to be a high school vocational agriculture teacher. Mm -hmm. And I spent my first two years as an animal science major. Mm -hmm. And I tried out for the judging team, and livestock judging. Mm -hmm. And so you had to give reasons. You always had to give oral reasons. And you had to tell why you picked this steer over that steer. And, um, but it was very different than regular public speaking. It was very loud and forceful. And um, you yeah, actually, because most of the time it was delivered outside somewhere. And so, you know, you, you, you just didn't do the normal things that you did for public speaking. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I joined the speech team. And my, about my sophomore year, um, I had to make the decision whether I was going to try out for the livestock team um, and commit myself, because if I made the national team, it was just intense. And about that time, I was deciding I didn't want to be a high school VOAG teacher and that I could either focus on debate or I could focus on livestock judging. And I thought, well, debate and speech has a much better application to the real world. Mm -hmm. So I ended up on the debate team, changed my major to ag business management, mm -hmm. and went on to become a scholarship by the Western Fair Association. So I was constantly meeting people, talking to people, mm -hmm. um, going to different fairs, working in different venues at the fair, um, and watching the managers and how they interacted with the public. Mm -hmm. And about that same time, I, uh, I took an argumentation class. Mm -hmm. And my coaches told me, well, now you can't not debate mm -hmm. because you have to do the research anyway. So now you don't have an excuse for why you're only doing the prepared events. Mm -hmm. Now you have to do the ones where you think on your feet. And, um, and I had been going to debate rounds forever with my colleagues. Um, I'd go do my events, and then I'd go watch them do their events. Mm -hmm. And I would be critiquing them and talking in the van on the way home, well, if you would have argued this, or you would have argued that, or you could have done this, this, or this. And my coaches were just really frustrated, they told me later, because I didn't think I was smart enough to, um, you know, to do this. So uh, they finally talked me into it, and of course, the very first tournament, I was very successful. Um, and, I, and my partner and I were. And I, won, I did partner debate and Lincoln-Douglas debate, and I, won I took second in partner debate, and I won Lincoln-Douglas debate. And, and then it was kind of monster was born. Um, and it really, but it really made me realize I do think quickly on my feet. I can um, you know, store information that I've learned. I can then take that and transfer it back out in a way that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I was really fortunate that my debate coaches really focused on communication, they focused on humor. They focused on making logical connections. Um, they wouldn't let us do what I call specious arguments, you know, just mm -hmm. arguments to the absurd. Um, so they were, they were very grounded in communication, mm -hmm. not, not just the game of debate. And so that made a really large impact on me. And then later when I coached debate at Oregon State, um, it, it made an impact on my students too because I wouldn't do speed drills. I wouldn't let my students do all the things that um, some other coaches would do so that they could get more information in. Mm -hmm. It was like, no, we're housed in the communication department. My salary is paid by the communication department. We're in the College of Liberal Arts. If the dean comes over and they can't understand you or they can't see that you're learning something that you can actually take from here and use, mm -hmm. then it's really not an extracurricular activity. It's, mm -hmm. you know, or a co-curricular activity. It's an extracurricular activity. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of underlied my um, foundation for how I 
competed and how I um, coached when I was a debate coach.